I'm not convinced it ain't no acting or accident with the track emits. You strap with gas that you ain't even practice with. The fact is, you couldn't hit the target the size of Hello. I will read to you a statement by today's subject. We're a nation of bootstrappers. We're visionaries. And we're not afraid to turn our visions into reality. That's the great thing about Americans. The word can't isn't part of our vocabulary. We've always been a can-do people. And we still are, despite all the negative things we hear about how corrupt our government has become, and despite the fact that we've become too reliant on the same government for things it has no business providing. We might have lost sight of it a little bit, but we are still the keepers of the American dream. That is the second paragraph in the book, I Ain't Got Time to Bleed by Jesse the Body Ventura. So there was a documentary that was done on Jesse the Body Ventura called Shocks the World. This is about Jesse the Body Ventura going from pro wrestler to Minnesota governor in 1998. And some of the stories that took place therein, it is a really good documentary. And it was done by PBS, actually. And if you wanted to watch it, you could watch it on the PBS uh, website. So since it's wrestling related, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about the way they talked about wrestling. We're going to talk about Jesse Devati Ventura's life story a little bit. And we're also going to you going to deal with, you know, some of his political opinions here and there. But overall, I think it was a pretty good documentary. They breezed over his uh, early life. They didn't spend a lot of time on it. Um, apparently he grew up with an older brother and he followed his brother into different pursuits, um, like sports and swimming and things like this. And of course led him into going into the military. Um, and of course he was a Navy SEAL, but this is actually where we kind of begin his, uh, his political career. He says he comes from Vietnam. He was 18 years old when the war ended and he was over there for near the tail end. He didn't really see a lot of uh, battle, you know, and he comes back and he's not old enough to to drink. He's not old enough to vote because at the time the voting age was 21. He was only 18. So he said this is basically the beginning of his political career as he starts marching against things like the draft and wanting to lower the voting age and different things like this. Now, they didn't talk about how he got into wrestling. They didn't even mention how the wrestling thing came to be. In his book, I Ain't Got Time to Bleed, he does talk about um, why he got into wrestling. And he got into wrestling because he saw superstar Billy Graham, who he patterned his entire uh, persona after. He apparently saw him when he was younger and said, I want, that's what I want to do for a living. And the, t the way they discussed wrestling in the documentary was uh, one of the guys in there, I forget who the talking head was. He said, wrestling is quote improv with drama and higher stakes. And um, they talked about seeing him on television, him being a local celebrity, um, being from the Minneapolis area and being on AWA TV tag teaming with Adrian Adonis. And how he, Adrian Adonis did all the in-ring work while Jesse did all the talking and basically how that team worked and how successful it was before Jesse went on to the WWF. And they again, they didn't go into too much detail of his wrestling career. They didn't get into any detail almost at all about the WWF. They basically says, hey, he was the guy who tried to unionize the WWF and he was the originator of the heel commentator. Uh, he was getting paid to do video games and all this kind of stuff. He famously sued Vince and won and, you know, just kind of skimmed along the top of his wrestling career. But I'm not surprised that they did that because this is PBS. They're not going to spend a lot of time, even on a guy who is a wrestler, they're not going to spend a lot of time on his wrestling. They spent the bulk of the time talking about his political career. Um, and I think that was probably one of the weaker points, not just because, you know, I know wrestling was something that he did for, you know, the earlier part of his life. And they did touch on it. They touched on everything that he did. He touched on his time as a Navy SEAL, his time as a you know swimming captain. But they didn't, you know, really go into it. Um, they, did, they didn't talk about how his love of wrestling came from his love of theater because he actually took theater in college. Another big weak thing that they didn't do 
they didn't talk about his family that much in terms of his wife. And this becomes very important because his wife is why he did not seek reelection when he became governor of Minnesota because she never supported it. She didn't want him to run for governor. And um, famously, she wanted them. She didn't want anything to do with it. And, you know, it was because of her that he decided not to run for governor. And even though some people have pushed for him to run for president, he has never done it because of his wife. I think she just kind of she's it feels like she's just a private person and he's an outgoing sort of gregarious, somewhat irritable guy. And she's just kind of like, I just want to hang back and, you know, you do you. But I don't want really to want all these cameras and and all this kind of stuff around. So I think that would have been a very strong humanizing element to uh, Jesse Ventura. If they'd have spoke more about his family, we didn't even get a lot about his parents or his brother or anything like that. We just we told we were told they exist, but they didn't spend a lot of time with them. Again, this thing was 56 minutes. It wasn't that long. But if you're going to do a documentary, and I, if I thought if WWE was going to do a documentary on Jesse Ventura, this thing, well, sorry, they probably will leave out the unionized part, but they probably would have spent a lot more time. It probably been structured the same way, but they probably would have spent a lot more time with his family as a, an important element for some of the decisions he made, some of the things he did. For instance, um, his mom, his mom was a nurse uh, in the military during World War II. And they talked. They made a. They made a uh, an effort to say that his mom outranked his dad in the military, because his mom was a head nurse. And Jesse Ventura supports abortion, and he says the reason why he supports abortion is because he talked to his mom, and his mom says that back in the day, back when she was a head nurse or whatever, uh, people would come in from these back alley abortions, and the mother and the baby would both be dead. There would be people with these horrible injuries all these different things. And as a nurse, she says, okay, this will make things uh, safer, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. And it makes sense from that perspective. I'm not going to go into the abortion issue in general, but it makes sense that he grew up in a house with somebody who is used to seeing people, you know, have terrible injuries from this particular procedure. And, her influence on him and the influence of other people on him. As you can see, when he tells a story about why he believes something, it's not facts and figures or statistics or anything like that. It's basically because he has a sort of human connection with that particular issue and these particular people. And this, it works in both ways. It cuts both ways. For instance, um, he supported gay marriage before other people, um, in the country supported gay marriage because he said he had a gay friend and he thought it was cruel that when his gay friend was sick, the gay friend's spouse, the word he used couldn't sit bedside because the idea was only spouses or next of kin. So husbands, wives or next of kin. So he figured if gays can get married, then my friend could have had his spouse, his or her spouse, bedside with her and again humanizing you look at it through a story of somebody that he actually knows and experience that he actually went through and that can that's very interesting you know and then it also goes the other way for instance he during a mass shooting that apparently that happened in minnesota he was also one of the first people to say that we should arm teachers <laughs> which got him a, a boatload of criticism and he says that you know there's people who think that there shouldn't be guns in schools and all this kind of stuff but he believes in the second amendment and people's ability to protect themselves even in schools so there is a lot of these little nuggets that are floating around in here but they talked about particularly what i've been mentioning so far is his connection with the people again he was a local celebrity he had been involved with some political activism. So I guess we got to talk about a little bit about why, how he got into politics. So apparently he was, you know, doing radio shows and basically when the old days of radio, you know, people would get into these debates on the radio and that's kind of how he became popular. 
And that ended up leading to him running for mayor. And then he met this guy, Dean Barkley, who was running for the U.S. Senate. And the two of them hit it off. Dean Barkley had uh, created or helped found the Reform Party, which was a third party in Minnesota. Even though Dean Barkley didn't win, um, Jesse Ventura became so popular that Dean Barkley then turned around and told Jesse, you need to run for governor of Minnesota. So for the first time, you know, um, Jesse Ventura decides to run for governor of Minnesota. He's running against, you know, a traditional Democrat, traditional Republican. Both of them have long money. Um, the Democrat who is Skip Humphrey and Skip Humphrey was the son of the vice president who served under John F. Kennedy. I mean, imagine that one of his political opponents is the son of a former vice president and used to be the attorney general of Minnesota. That was crazy. And that was the Democrat um, that was running for governor of Minnesota in 1998. Now, one of my favorite parts of this documentary is they talked about why Jesse Ventura was able to get people to take him seriously and how he was able to get different uh pockets of people to support him specifically the youth and one of the things was they said he had an action figure so when he ran for office they created jesse ventura political action figures and this apparently became a really popular thing that he did but another one that he did that was actually pretty funny is he was known as jesse the body ventura so he did a uh, <laughs> a commercial that, re that referred to him as Jesse the Mind Ventura. And it was sort of a parody of the old statue of the thinker where he was nude and it, the camera was panning around him as it says certain things and it's like the mind and Jesse's the mind. And uh, <laughs> it was really funny. Like it was really a really good campaign ad. I really liked that. That was, that was very cute. So what he wanted to do was change people's perception of him from being a pro wrestler to being a sort of intellectual. And he was able to do this because as a sort of middle ground, third party uh, activist type, he was not beholden to either major party or either special interest group, which is a big thing when it comes to political politics in the United States is most of these Democrats and Republicans are captured by special interest groups. So he was able to do both things. Like I talked about earlier, how he might've been supporting some progressive ideas like uh, abortion, gay marriage, legalizing uh, marijuana, you know, um, and the way he also has some traditionally conservative ideas too: smaller government, uh, eliminating the income tax, all these kinds of things. And most people can gather around somebody who doesn't seem to be the, in the extreme in either way. So he ended up winning over a lot of the students, a lot of the student body on the college campuses. And that is pretty much what pushed him into office was his large following of students. And so then from there, we start hearing about how Jesse sort of a, a traditional progressive with, you know, um, feminist views on women and, you know, but they also had the paradox of he's trying to be an intellectual, but he's still very large and imposing, kind of intimidating. He's a very serious man, but he also does things like he called the media to a, a press conference only for it to be uh, an April Fool's Day joke. They, they, those kinds of things where I, I liked it. Like he's kind of like a a regular guy at the same time he's hanging out with celebrities and there's celebrities coming to see him in office. They showed Eartha Kitt doing like some kind of gymnastic stuff on his desk. Uh, they have Donald Trump, you know, who was at the time third party, uh, had not officially run for any kind of office or anything yet talking about how he wanted to support of Jesse Ventura. There's like plenty of people, like all kinds of celebrities showing up and basically he becomes a political rock star and he shows that he is a regular guy who is very middle of the road. And you see him doing trade deals with Cuba when the government is like, you can't do trade deals with Cuba because we don't have regular relationships with Cuba. 
but he wants to do it anyway. So he's going to Cuba to do trade deals. He's going to China. He's smoking stogies on, you know, the, the great wall of China. It's great shit. You know, like it's just like great stuff. And you see, like, Jesse Ventura is an epic man. He's just not like a regular cool guy. He's doing epic shit. You know, like, he's, he's just doing stuff that you shouldn't see a regular politician do. And this actually is, was rubbing the media the wrong way. Because while he's governor, he's still doing a lot of other things. He's still acting. He's still um, going to WWE. He was doing the XFL commentary thing while he was the governor of Minnesota and the legislature and all these people were like, what are you doing? Like, how are you the governor and you're doing part-time jobs? Like you're doing refereeing at SummerSlam. Like, what are you doing? You can't do this stuff. And they accused him of trying to use the office of governor for personal gain. And they wanted to stop him from doing whatever he wanted. But he saw himself as, despite the fact that he was governor, he saw himself as a private citizen who, hey, as long as the, the taxpayer isn't paying for it, who cares what I do? And that's a good point, you know. But at the same time, I also understand the legislature. You don't want these guys becoming president or whatever and then trying to use that to become an even bigger celebrity. And in their perspective, that's what Jesse was trying to do. But the most important thing, and I think it's the funniest thing, is they talked a lot about you wouldn't have Donald Trump without Jesse Ventura and how, you know, Jesse Ventura is what Donald Trump, you know, based a lot of his political career off of. And they showed you a really good example. Jesse Ventura called the media jackals and he gave them a press pass with his face on it that says official jackal for Jesse Ventura or something like that. And this was their press pass. And they had to wear that to the press conferences and stuff like this. It was funny because he said it was a joke, but the contentious relationship with the media, that became his thing. They would ask him questions and either he would, you know, rebuff them or he, you know, try to muscle them around or whatever. But he had a contentious relationship with the media. So that was sort of the proto version of what you would see with Donald Trump when he used, when he used to call these guys fake news. You saw that a little bit with, on the local level with Jesse Ventura. And they even talked about this in the documentary that some of Trump's people had come to watch Jesse Ventura while he was in office and they took notes and they had talked to Dean Barkley, especially when Dean Barkley was appointed to the U.S. Senate by Jesse Ventura. They would come around and talk to them and pick their brain. And so a lot of what Donald Trump did or, you know, what he, the, the, his relationship with the, uh, with the media, his, you know, gregarious, outgoing personality, um, b going on the attack, using humor to win over young people. Those were the kinds of things that Jesse Ventura had done. And they're like, you wouldn't have Donald Trump without Jesse Ventura. And then they talked, of course, about how they were friends at first. And now Jesse Ventura hates Donald Trump. He he almost wants to run for president just so he can beat Donald Trump. He thinks that January 6th is the worst thing that ever occurred in human history. And Donald Trump is a draft dodger and it's all this stuff, you know. But these were guys who used to be friends. And it shows like plenty of pictures of them together. And it was it was funny when you really look at the parallels of how uh, how much they do sort of parallel. For instance, one of the things with Jesse Ventura, they used to say, oh, well, he's calling himself this feminist icon because he used to march for women's rights, but then he would go in Playboy and say he wants to be reincarnated as a double D bra. Or they talk about how in his book, they, he blamed his wife for his low grades because this is what women do to you. And this kind of stuff where... You're like, OK, he's clearly, you know, got a bit of a sense of humor and it's funny. But these folks are taking everything he says very, very seriously. They're they're being very critical. So when you see Trump's relationship with the media and you see Jesse Ventura's relationship with the media, a lot of it is the same where Trump is trying to be funny. 
the media wants to take it and make it incredibly negative. They were doing the same thing to Jesse Ventura. They, of course, talked about some of the things that he got done in politics, like uh, the light rail, which <laughs> light rails, boy, boy, let me tell you about light rails. There is almost no bigger cons failure of massive public infrastructure than public trains. Public trains are almost always a massive failure. Partially, the reason for that is even if you get the political willpower, it's hard to do it over a long period of time, which is necessary for things like trains in order to work. For instance, here in Detroit, we had things called a queue line and we got all these people involved. They were so excited for the queue line, all these sponsors to do the queue line, but it wasn't sustainable. We got it to you know a certain point. And then the interest in it started to trail off. And you can see that a lot of big ticket infrastructure uh, issues in the United States, particularly, they have a lot of fervor behind them initially. People are pushing, 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 but they don't realize that these things are investments. These are not purchases. It's not like you saving up to buy a television. This is a light rail system. You know, this thing costs billions and billions of dollars. It's going to take hundreds of hours to build. If you're less, you're really, really dedicated to it. These things will eventually lose you tons of money. Even if it, even if it actually gets built, it loses you tons of money in the long run, especially once all of the people start the, the greedy corporatist types, they start getting their fingers in it. The unions start getting their fingers in it. These things become boondoggles. So maybe it worked out where he actually got the thing built, which is good. You know, there's some positives to public transportation that people will beat you over the head with about how, you know, do you have a moral authority or a moral priority to help out, you know, old people or the disabled or people who can drive, et cetera, et cetera, as, you know, driving becomes less needed because you have more things like uber and lyft and you know different ways of transporting yourself then it becomes about poor people and all this kind of stuff but then you see in new york how the subways and these various trains just become houses for homeless folks and crack addicts and stuff like that so there's there's of course two sides to every issue but the train thing very interesting uh the government building stuff is always going to be a picadillo of mine but uh, public transit is one of those things that you always get into an argument with progressives about because they believe so great in public transit, but they always complain about the same things. You have the more people you have involved with public transit, the slower the process is, which means if you live in a place like Minnesota, like you live here in Detroit, these buses and things, the light rails or whatever, they get slower the more people that are on them because there's a lot of people on them. So you know, that's the thing. So some people would prefer to use mass transit, but you start thinking about quality of life issues, like how long does it take to get to a place? You have to worry about uh, the kinds of people you may run into on public transit. You have to worry about uh, standing out in the cold or waiting out in the rain or these kind of things. And then, of course, the ever increasing costs to ride these devices. You know, we have this stuff it's just a really good debate to have and conversation to have about public transit. But Jesse Ventura was one of the guys who believed in it. He wanted to have mass transit. He got it done and he was able to do it because he was a, a guy who made a decision, but listen to the people around him. And that was one of the things that I was very impressed with and listening to and watching the documentary is that because he wasn't a Democrat or a Republican, he got to make decisions based off of who he thinks would be the best people to to deal with that issue. So when it became time to pick judges, he would go to like uh, the bar, the Minnesota State Bar, and say, okay, who are the best attorneys? We don't care if they're Democrats or Republicans. You know, who are the best attorneys? I want to make those people judges. When it became time for to put together um, different his cabinet, it was Democrats and Republicans in his cabinet, people who ran was able to run their individual division because that was their area of expertise. It wasn't just paying back political favors, which is what political appointees are. They're essentially uh, political favors. Hey, we got you elected. So you need to put our guy in this position. 
And that's typically how government runs. And that's why they run things into the ground is because they don't give people who have any expertise, the ability to operate anything. Cause it's not based off expertise. It's not based off merit. It's based off of how many palms did you grease and who do you know? And so he, because he was in that position, it's a very unique perspective. He was able to do that. And I found that to be very enlightening, especially for somebody who doesn't live in Minnesota. I thought it was very cool. I'm interested in how Minnesotans feel about that, specifically about that time if they're old enough to have existed at that time. Um, the big issue, I think, was the Jesse checks, which is uh, a very interesting piece of business that they actually do in Alaska. So the idea was that every time the state had a surplus, which is they have more money left over than what they spend, he would give the taxpayers a rebate. So he would give them their money back. This is a great idea in theory. Okay. In theory is a wonderful idea because you're just saying, we got all the money we need. Here's your money back. In the end though, those things still need to be processed. That stuff starts to cost you money. It's probably easier to just cut the taxes than to cut people a check. But then again, you know, it's, it is what it means. You can't tell people not to give away free money. There's no such thing as free money. Even in terms of giving people back the money that you claimed that, that you owe them, it's still kind of free money. You're better off just letting them keep the money that they have than saying we're going to process this because you still have to pay people to process it and you have to pay people to process it to send it back. It's a good idea. and It's one of those good ideas in theory that um, is probably better with time better spent on just going to the root of the issue, which is if you're continuously having budget surpluses, that means you're overtaxing the people. You can cut the taxes rather than to continuously give money back. And also the, the Jesse checks stopped because a financial recession ended up um, running the state into uh, deficits. So Jesse Ventura ended up, I think he came into office with a surplus of about $3 billion and he ended up leaving office with a deficit. That means money lost over time of about $4 billion. That means that he spent a lot of money. <laughs> Some of it probably went to that light rail. Some of it definitely was uh, giving away free money in terms of the Jesse checks. Everybody thinks that free money is a good idea until you realize it makes you sound like the Joker and Batman. I'm giving away free money. And you're like, that's not really free money. It's their taxpayers, taxpayer money. You're just giving it back, which sounds good, except you shouldn't have never took it in the first place. But it's easier to levy taxes than it is to cut taxes at, you know, some points. Uh, this old gimmick is called a rebate anyway. You've probably seen these when it comes to uh, corporations where they'll say get a $20 rebate if you buy this refrigerator. It means you buy it, you turn around and send the proof of purchase or whatever to the corporation and they send you a check. It takes forever for them to do it. And then, of course, um, you have to pay income tax on it because it's income. So... It's not really a great idea. Anyway, we end these documentaries um, on how much he hates Donald Trump and how much he might consider running for president against Donald Trump and wanting to debate Donald Trump. I I thought that was basically the point of this thing was we're going to talk about how much he hates Donald Trump. But they didn't. They talked a little bit about his conspiracy theories in term of Gen, uh, JFK. They didn't go into some of the other conspiracy theories that he believes but that he has become a connoisseur of uh, JFK conspiracies. And uh, that's probably the funniest, most entertaining bit about Jesse Ventura in modern years is how much of a conspiracy theorist he is. And that's kind of become his legacy. You know, people forgot that he was a wrestler. People forget that he was governor, but they never forget that he looks like the crazy guy standing on a street corner yelling about uh conspiracies um <laughs> interesting bit and i think i want to end on this is with his support for uh, medical marijuana and this was a political battle that he actually won long after he left office is that he continued to argue for medicinal marijuana medicinal hemp etc and eventually minnesota did pass that law and he was there when they did it you know 
And he found that to be one of his greatest political achievements is when he didn't even wasn't even in office is that he was able to get finally the state of Minnesota to accept medicinal marijuana and medicinal hemp. So I think that's going to be, end up being a pretty good legacy for the guy. It, I don't have to agree with everything that he thinks, but I support that he was ballsy enough to go out there and, and get things done. I like the independent spirit. I love the quote that I began at the beginning of this thing. Jesse Ventura is a fascinating individual. And this documentary, I think it was very surface level, but it was PBS. So that was the best they could do. Um, I would love to see somebody else take another shot at it and probably go a little bit deeper. You could definitely do a two to three part documentary on Jesse Ventura just based off of his wrestling, his uh, political career and his everything he's done since he left office, the television shows that he's done. Um, you could actually wrap some of his Hollywood stuff into his pro wrestling career. There was just so much that he's done. And you think about it, like he is a very fascinating man. You know, uh, Jesse Ventura was an epic man. Well, he is because he's still alive. He is an epic man who does epic man shit. And that makes something very cool with me. I don't have to agree with everything he says, but I give a thumbs up to every epic man out there. Uh, thank you guys for your time. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out. Oh, 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 oh,